What could be amazing with you is if you understand what's perfectly right with you and you can amplify that as a, as a game-changing tool in your life. Colby's done that for me. Welcome to the Wealth Strategy Secrets of the Ultra Wealthy Podcast, where we help entrepreneurs like you exponentially build wealth through passive income to live a life of freedom and prosperity. Are you tired of paying too much in taxes, gambling your future on the stock market, and want to learn about hidden strategies for making your money work for you? And now your host, Dave Wolcott, serial entrepreneur and author of the best-selling book, The Holistic Wealth Strategy. Hey everyone, welcome to today's show on Wealth Strategy Secrets. We've got another excellent show today. Today we're joined by Richard Canfield. In 2009, Richard's life changed completely when he read the book, Becoming Your Own Banker, Unlock the Infinite Banking Concept by R. Nelson Nash. He knew this was what he had been looking for all his life. Nelson Nash became his personal friend and mentor, and Richard and his team now teach his powerful message of financial hope and control to North Americans. As an Amazon best-selling author, podcast host, and authorized infinite banking practitioner, Richard is passionate about putting people in the driver's seat of their financial life and creating durable, dependable generational wealth. They work with families, business owners, and real estate investors to strategize how they can keep more of the hard-earned money that flows through their hands over a lifetime. You may already recognize Richard as the co-host of the Wealth Without Bay Street podcast and co-author of Canadian's Guide to Wealth Building Without Risk, as well as Cash Follows the Leader. Richard, welcome to the show. I'm super pumped to be with you, Dave. I'm just uh, so excited to be here and, and to be able to try to add some value to your, your amazing listeners, your great community. And, um, you know, you and I, before hitting the go button, we, we were talking about a lot of our, our unique similarities and, and our overlapping, uh, you know, connections, contacts, and uh, just the way we kind of view and think about the world. So I'm, I'm just so pumped and excited to be with you here today and uh, talk about something I'm passionate about, but something you are also uniquely passionate about. So it's going to be a ton of fun. Yeah, really grateful uh, to have you on the show, Richard. I think uh, listeners are really going to enjoy this one. And, you know, like you said, just, you know, just sharing these like minded ideas with people so that they can get insights, you know, and make better, you know, decisions in their own lives and how that applies. You know, that's what this is all about. So, so why don't we kick things off? And, um, you know, for people who aren't familiar with you, tell us a little bit about your, your background, your journey and how it all started for you. Well, um, you know, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll go back actually a long ways back. So when I was when I was a little a little kid, I grew up in a very small farming community uh, outside of Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, home of the Edmonton Oilers, if anyone's familiar. And um, you know, so I you know I grew up building fences, working on the farm, doing all that kind of stuff. I understood like hard work right away, and uh, you know that was kind of our our envision. We had a, we had a small family based business. Um, I was the heir to the portable toilet kingdom of Camrose, Alberta. So uh, a prince to the throne, as I like to say. And uh, so I learned a lot of lessons in that small family-owned business. But we were the typical family-owned business operators. We were operators, tech, you know, technicians, not business owners. We didn't understand the fundamentals and the learning about business. There wasn't, we didn't know about the coaching and, hey, all that stuff existed way back then. But we just didn't know about it. It wasn't like... You know that today in the in the in the ecosphere of the internet and the the interwebs and the tic tacs and the facebooks there's all these opportunities for people to learn those kind of skill sets and you know of course with strategic coach which you and i spoke about i mean that's an amazing opportunity to learn how to think differently in skill sets and so we didn't have necessarily the access to those things so we just kind of put our heads down and worked hard heads down work hard heads down work hard and that's kind of all we really knew and so i learned a lot of lessons in that environment and when i was quite young i was actually known as the bank in my house i always had cash available i kept it and stored it you know in my closet you know and i would i would have family members if they need you know need a cash even my parents need cash to go out for the day or whatever they just didn't have any available in their wallet they would come to me and i would make them write an iou on a piece of paper <laughs> What I didn't understand, though, is I didn't understand interest. There was no learning. There was no teaching about interest or charging interest or charging fees for late repayment. Like, I didn't understand any of those components, but I understand I needed to track the money. So I learned some things really early on in that environment. And some of that's because I'm, you know, the youngest of, you know, multiple kids. And so I got to see the experience of other people ahead of me. And I got, like, basically some intellectual shortcuts about things I didn't want my life to be like, things that I maybe didn't attract, I didn't want to go down. 
And so I recognized that I needed to really kind of hone in on the money. And early on in my life, you know, roughly when I was about 11 years old, my mom told me I had to start buying all my own stuff. We were, I was going to get paid, although it wasn't like an official wage and it was never consistent. It was basically money that they had available based on how, you know, uh, a seasonal business kind of shifted throughout the year. But I work like a kind of like a rented mule and, uh, and I would get paid, but I had to go buy my own things, my own clothes. I wanted extra food or snacks or things that, you know, outside of just a house over your roof and, and food on the table, I had to do a lot of that on my own. It was one of the best things that ever happened to me. So I started to realize the value of what a dollar could do for you. I mean, today we talk about the devaluation of dollars, which we probably won't get into today. But I mean, fundamentally, it, it was important to understand that the more you manage your money, the more money you'll have to manage. And that's something I learned years later, a great quote from a friend of mine who's a real estate investor. And so I was always watching the dollars in some way. And then I, I realized later on when I started getting into personal development at a very early age, uh, around age 19, I started doing my first kind of personal development uh, programs and, you know, some very high end intense type programs. I've done the whole walk on hot coals thing and all that kind of stuff. I started to realize what, what, what do I want to do in the world? How do I want to show up and add value into the world? And it just, what really connected with me is if people had a better understanding of how to manage their money and how to take control over their money, how to be in the driver's seat of their money, they would have the result of that behavior would they would have more money. And if they have more money, well then what's the ripple effect of that? What's the reduction in stress? How does it improve their relationships with their spouse, with their children, with the, with everything that's going on? And if we can pull, you know, stress is the, the probably the number one health issue that people have. And if we can reduce that in some way, well, what's the number one cause of stress in most households? What well, has to do with money? And so if we can solve some of that problem, even a little incremental bits at a time, because the, the journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. Well, in your financial life, you got to take steps to improve it. I mean, there's just no other way around it. And so that whole drive and experience, it led me into investment real estate. It led me become a bunch of you know real estate groups and organizations and continue my personal development journey. And then leading up to 2009, you know, a really good friend of mine and co-host of our podcast, you know, my, and a co-author of our, of our books, Jason Lowe, amazing guy. He's, you know, without Jason, I don't know where I'd be today, but he introduced me to this book, Becoming Your Own Banker. When I got this book in 2009, at the time I was a licensed uh, realtor uh, in, our, in my local en environment. And uh, I, I was only into my second year of doing that, you know, really actually it was probably 12 months into doing it. And uh, I read this book and I had this. You, you, you ever have, you ever had that experience, Dave, where you're just like really, really angry and frustrated, but you can't put your finger on it. You don't know why you've had that experience. Yes. Yeah. Maybe some of your listeners have had that experience. And so I was like that. And I was having a very, was, I got this book in the summer. It was a very busy real estate season for me. I had a lot going on. And so like a lot of people read this book in like two, three hours. I read it over two weeks because I would, you know, I would start, stop, start, stop, start, stop. And, um, what I realized is after that, I started getting, um, like kind of snippy with people. I had a chat, like a chip on my shoulder and that's not really a lot like me, but I couldn't figure out what was going on. What I realized was happening later on. It, it came to me later is that I knew fundamentally I needed to teach people what was in this book. I didn't know it was in the book. I didn't know it before I got the book. I didn't know. And you, what you don't know is a big problem. You, you, and the more that you realize, the more you learn, the more you bring in knowledge into your life, the more you discover that which you didn't know. It, it exposes you to so many new things. It's like a, it's like a rock on a pond and that, that, that ripple effect of expansion of your own knowledge base. And so when I read this book, I, a whole new doorway got open for me. The thing I had always been looking for, I always knew when I got my very first rental property mortgage at age 18, I was a, you know, a, T technically a landlord at 12, but at age 18, I, I got my first, you know, mortgage on my own. And I looked at the mortgage document and I looked at the, you know, the, I ran an amortization on my own and I went and bought a book that all it had was numbers where you could flip through it and you could see the interest rate and the amount and you could calculate the payments and you could see the amortization. I went and bought that book for fun. And I, cause I was just fascinated. Like, Hey, I get the real estate. I get that I, I, I'm winning in this deal, but like, what's these, these guys, the bank, what's their deal? What's up with them? And I realized that's the passive income I wanted. I want that payment stream. We're on the wrong side of this deal. How do we get onto that side of the deal? And of course I discovered a few different ways to do that. But then when I got this book, becoming your own banker, wow, that sounds incredible. Is that possible? Well, the answer is it is possible. And it all begins with how we think everything starts there. 
But when you understand the fundamentals, what you can create in your life is really, really powerful. And so, you know, digging into that, I realized I, I would be doing a disservice to myself and I would be out of uh, in my own integrity, my own personal integrity, if I did not tell people about this book. So that led me onto the journey of becoming an authorized practitioner, eventually meeting Nelson Nash, the author, getting to know Nelson and, and just, wow, what an unbelievable human being. I'm sure you've got some incredible mentors in your life, Dave, as, a, as I'm, I suspect your listeners do. Nelson is one of those people where he was like an enigma. The moment that you got into his, his gravity, it just sucked you in and, and you just, he just, he really managed to convey and download information into you in a way that was just so simple and so powerful. And, uh, I, I really respect learning from individuals who've, who've experienced life over a long time frame. Now he passed away four years ago, um, in, uh, March of 2019. And, um, you know, so very sad day, of course, but he was 88, he would say 88 revolutions around the sun. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and he was still phoning people from the hospital bed. He was about to go into a surgery. He was pretty sure he wasn't coming out, but he was phoning people from the hospital. He was checking in with them and he was talking about, you know, it's all about the message. It's all about the message. And, uh, and he was, he was just continually giving, he didn't believe in retirement. He believed in living a life of value and adding value to others. He believed in mentorship and those kind of things. So his book and, and what he taught people is a lot about that. And, you know, he was a real estate investor. He had a forestry background. He did a lot of land deals and some of his most profitable deals were, were land deals and, uh, and development deals. And many of those deals came because he took a policy loan from an insurance contract that he owned because that's where he stored his money. He, you need a warehouse for money. Money's got to rest somewhere while you're waiting for it to go do something. You got to go on vacation. You got to buy a new car. You're going to buy Christmas gifts. You're going to go and invest in the next real estate deal. You're going to invest in the next, you know, offering memorandum, the next multifamily unit project. You're going to invest in Bitcoin, whatever it is you're going to do. Money's got to go from the place that you keep it to the thing that you want to do. It's a transaction. Okay. That's what banking is. Banking is the movement of money from one place to another in a relatively short period of time. The problem is most people in North America don't recognize that they actually should be the one controlling the function of that movement and where they store the money. And then they, when they store the money, they're storing it in someone else's bank. You get paid for your work. You get paid for your, your rents from your real estate. You get paid for your business. All the money goes into someone else's bank and it sits there waiting to pay the bills and do the things of life. Someone else's bank gets all of your money before you do. So if you understand the power of becoming your own banker, you can slowly and incrementally transition that money that's resting and sitting idle in someone else's bank into a system that you own and control with a, a, a mutually owned insurance company, which is a financial institution that is not a bank, but they have certain fundamental features and benefits when done the right way that allow you to mimic and model similar banking functions that you get to control. So it's not that the insurance company is doing it, it's that you're doing it. So, you know, you can save and borrow money over at a regular traditional brick and mortar bank, or you can save and borrow money over from an insurance company. The difference is who do you own and how much control do you have? That's what infinite banking is all about. Well, wow, such a great overview and the epiphany that you had, right, when you picked up the book, um, you know, quite, quite a story. I love how Peter Diamandis actually calls it your MTP or your massive transformational purpose, right? You kind of, you know, figure out what it is, you know, you are to do in life. Um, <laughs> you remember the movie with Steve Martin and the jerk. <laughs> He's like, mom, I found my purpose, you know, <laughs> um, but I think it's just so important right for people to kind of figure out that purpose and i love how uh you know you actually you know ground everything um with that concept of like you know you know creating you know creating financial freedom you know creating understanding what this is before because i i really you know view this the same way right there's lots of different products that are out there to do different things but let's start with you know your vision and and what it is to you right and as dan sullivan likes to say a lot of that is based on these four freedoms of how we're driven right we're trying to create freedom of money we're trying to create freedom of purpose relationship and time 
right? To do all these things that we want to do. And so then you start to look at some of these alternative products or these things like infinite banking, you know, and you talk about, you know, control, right? And you talked about reducing stress, you know, and you talked about having your money work for you, you know, so all of these, you know, multiple things that actually drive you closer, you know, towards those freedoms. So, um, you know, really appreciate that sentiment that you, you really come at this with. When you, you can't put a price on control and you could try, you could do your best to measure it. Some people might, you know, if they're like super high fact finders or whatever on their Colby score, but ultimately, you know, just ask yourself that question. What do you value? What value do you place on having control, especially control around your own money, control around your own financial decisions? And look at the things that you're doing today and write them down. Okay, well, I'm, hey, I'm in a 401k or I'm in a, you know, IRA or I'm in a, R, you know, Canada and RSP. I'm in a reg some kind of a tax qualified registered plan. I'm, you know, I'm doing this. I've got that. I'm in the stock market. I've got, you know, some rental. I got all these things, these buckets of money and I got to borrow money. I got to do all these things. Well, to what degree do you have a measurement of control? You know, today at the time of this recording, we're, we're dealing with some uncertainty in the banking realm. There's been a few big collapses in the news lately and that sort of thing. And, and so even if you just think about having your money on demand deposit. So, so first off, every time that you put your money into a bank as a deposit, they issue you a, 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 a slip, basically a deposit slip. Well, that's a receipt that basically says they owe you the money. In other words, you're a creditor, you're an unsecured creditor of that bank. So that as soon as you give that money, you're exchanging the custody of the money to them. It's now their money. And all you have is a demand slip that says you can get it back as long as they have it. That's really what you have. And the whole reason that works is because we built a system of quote unquote trust. We have trust in the system. Well, as soon as that trust is broken, now you start to see the issue of bank runs and all kinds of problems that, that get created. And I don't want to go down that rabbit hole too far, but when you're dealing with a, a properly structured, well-designed insurance company that's got a long history and you're doing your business there, you have similar functions and features. It's not identical, but similar. You still need a convenience of a debit card. But if you're storing your money there and that money is now in constant motion, it's actually yours. You're the owner. You co-own the company. When you want to borrow and access capital, you can access whatever's available to be lent from your pool, but you're accessing it from the insurance company. So you're not borrowing your money, you're borrowing their money. So your money is constantly in motion and it never stops. It's uninterrupted for the rest of time. The only thing that interrupts it is that somebody dies. Okay, well, that's pretty easy to solve because you just get insurance policy on everyone you reasonably can. And then you're diversified in lives, <laughs> lives insured. Mm -hmm. All right, so there, there, you can create this multi-generational aspect. But the key thing is you're in the driver's seat. You dictate the terms, the terms of the borrowing, when you're getting it, how you get it, how much you get when you pay it back, what terms do you want? What time frame? What interest? All those things you determine versus jumping through someone else's hoops to do it. See, we're always dealing with borrowed money. You're going to need the use of money through the rest of your life. I don't know anybody that gets out of here without of it. All right. You, you, one day we're going to graduate. And up until today and that day, we need the use of money. Okay. We can agree on that. Well, we got to store it someplace while we're waiting for it to do things. Would you rather store it in someone else's system where they earn all the profits and the revenue? Or would you rather store in a system where you have ownership and control, where you get to share in the profits with a bunch of other people who are just like you? And the worst case scenario is that somebody dies. Well, that's always the worst case scenario. In one situation, you got to deal, your, your family's got to deal with the money in the bank. In the other situation, they get a tax-free check. Seems like a bit of a no-brainer. <laughs> Yeah, good points, Richard. So I'd like to actually back up a step, okay? And I think there's so much confusion in the marketplace on, you know, what even is infinite banking. It's actually called many different things. There's a lot of confusion in the marketplace. Um, we can have that discussion on another day. Uh, but what I want to do is just make this really practical for the audience, right? So just give us your, you know, definition of, you know, what is infinite banking? What, what, what even is it, right? Can you explain that? And then let's jump into some very practical examples of how people could use this in their lives. Yeah. So, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to go right to the source, which is Nelson's book, Becoming Your Own Banker, right on page three. Um, the whole idea is to recapture the interest that one is paying to banks and finance companies for the major items that you need during a lifetime, such as automobiles, major appliances, education, homes, investment opportunities, 
business equipment, etc. This book or the infinite banking concept is not about investments of any kind. It is about how one finances the things of life, which can certainly include investments. That's what infinite banking is. Infinite banking is, in, in my definition, I would say it is a way of life. It is something that you do. You are always banking. It's just how much of it do you control? With the infinite banking process and the concept implemented in your life, there's some there's some mechanical tool related aspects there that are required to implement it. But the actual act of doing it is something that you do on an ongoing basis for the rest of your life. And it's how much of that lifestyle and that mindset do you bring into your life when it comes to all of your financial transactions that will determine how much of that financial value as it's flowing through your life, the cash flow that's running through your life, how much of that can you contain so that you can reuse it as many times as possible while you're alive and then leave as much of it behind tax-free to the people you love and care about when you're gone. So it's about harnessing the cash flow that's running through your life so that it can do more than one job for you as many times as possible. Yeah, that was great. Very succinct. So let's get into a, a real specific use case. Um, you, you know, let's give us maybe, you know, your top two use cases of how somebody could use this, because I know sometimes conceptually someone might hear this and say like, OK, OK, I think I get this or I've read the book but they're still only dipping their toe in, right? They haven't utilized it. Or uh, we also talk to a lot of folks who say, oh, I ha I've had this policy set up, but they don't really know how to use it, right? So, so walk us through an example to make it real. Uh, so I'll give, you, uh, I'll give you the first one that kind of comes to mind. I'll use a personal example. So uh, you know, right now in my, in my family system, I have, I have 12 policies. These are whole life insurance policies. They're all optimized for the purposes of this concept. And uh, I'm looking at adding a 13th one here in the next couple of months. And so I'm always looking at a way to grow my system, just like you want to grow all of your assets. Okay. To me, it's just an asset in my portfolio of assets that I'm accumulating as I go. Well, I, I did a conversion on my wife recently. My wife is an amazing stay at home mom. Uh, so, you know, I, I needed to convert some insurance on her and I've been waiting to do that. I I had the original policy set up maybe eight years ago, and I've been waiting for the right time to convert it. So I did that here about a year ago. And the policy uh, is around $36,000 a year. Okay, so that's the annual premium. The minimum required amount, I'll just keep the number super simple, is about 10,000. It's a little less than that, but let's just call it 10. So 10 is the required amount that I, I, need, I want to contribute every year. And 26,000 is completely optional and totally flexible to me. So I dictate the terms of when I want to put in what time in the year, when I fund it, how I fund it, if I fund it, all those things are up to me. That's control, 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 control. You know, the three magic words in uh, real estate is location, location, location. The three magic words in the infinite banking system is control, control, control. <laughs> okay. And to what degree do you have control over everything that you're doing? And so the purpose of this policy was twofold. Number one, I, I needed to convert some permanent coverage on my wife. It was something I wanted to do anyway. So they're, so checking a box. And then secondly, well, you know, I have to pay a tax bill every year. You know, I don't know too many people that get out of the get out of the the year without having something due to the, to the IRS or the CRA in Canada. All right, so uh, you know, with my business, I set aside. I operate with something called Profit First, which you may be familiar with, and I have accounts that I separate every dollar that comes in in revenue, and I separate that top line revenue, and I and I you know I put it towards its different accounts, and one of those accounts is a tax account. Well, every year I'm planning for that tax bill. And, you know, the, the, in my case, the Canadian government's going to get the money. They have no sense of humor about it at all. If I don't want to pay them, I mean, they're, they're going to make a big stink about that. I can tell you for sure. And so, especially the way they're spending money these days. So I'm going to go ahead and, and make that, that payment. Well, I want to harness that payment, that, that tax payment to do something for my family before it goes to the government. All right. Well, it turns out my tax bill is roughly speaking somewhere between 25 and 40,000 a year for that one corporation. So I turns out my $36,000 a year premium, I was already setting the money aside to pay the tax bill. So I just ran it through a premium. Shortly after I did that, I borrowed around $23,000 from that policy within a couple of days. And I used that along with a little bit of extra capital I had set aside in the corporation. I was capitalized enough that I could pay my tax bill and I paid the tax bill. Let's say that it was 35 grand. So I used some of the policy funds to do that from the insurance company's money and some excess money I had available. But the entire amount of the tax bill ran into a system I own and control for the rest of my life first. Mm -hmm. 
In the process of doing that, I instantly created about $120,000 of additional permanent whole life tax-free death benefit on my wife in one shot. I increased my ability to, eat, to earn a dividend, which is a share of the, of the, the reserve profits, the, the divisible surplus of the insurance company, which I now co-own for every future year and time that they're in business. I get to earn a share of their profits because I'm a co-owner. They distributed that to me one time per year. And then I get to decide how to use that, which we won't get into today. So, so that whole ripple effect came into place. So now every time I pay a tax bill, I get to run the money through a policy that I own and control. So I have constant motion on that tax bill that it was going to go out the door so it can do more jobs for my family before I give it to the government. Now, once that system is built, each and every year it gets better. And so if my tax bill begins to grow, well, I've already built a system that allows me to, to capture that growing tax bill because I'm being more profitable every year. Does that make sense? So Absolutely. I've created an environment that allows me to take the same money that would already be automatically walking away from me, cash flow, leaving every single year, going to a government facility, they're still going to get paid, but I'm going to dictate the terms of how they get paid and where they get paid from. They're going to get paid with the insurance company's money, not my money. My money's in constant motion. Now, the next year, I have to start saving up to pay the tax bill for the following year, correct? Well, you know, yes. the, you know where I put all that money before I put it in, you know, as soon as it you know, deposits into the bank, I make a transfer and I pay down the policy loan. The policy loan's repaid and then I build up what I need for the premium again. And then I pay the premium again. And then I take a, a loan and I pay the tax bill. So I'm in a cycle now where I control the environment. Those are all banking transactions. This isn't an investment. I'm not investing any money in the insurance company or in this or in that. I'm not talking about a rate of return. I'm talking about containment of cash flow for as long as humanly possible. So you're taking on the control there of your capital and then you're putting it to work, adding more velocity to it by putting it in the policy before you have to make that future payment. And in, in addition to that, you're also creating, you know, more value through the life insurance uh, that you set up as well. That's correct. And so let's, let's talk of another example of that. Something that people do and they, they, you know, a lot of people like to pay down their mortgage. Okay. And you may have different, you know, everyone has different thoughts on that. Real estate investors, you know, have different thoughts on that and they vary all over the map. All right. So, so, but a lot of people will pay down, pay down debt. Okay, great. There's nothing wrong with paying down debt. However, wouldn't it be better to recapture the debt? So what if you could eliminate the third party lender? It's for your car. It's for the, the family vacation. It's for some business equipment that you purchased. It's for your home mortgage, whatever that third party lender is in your life. Well, you're going to send your good money to them. Well, before you send it to them, what if you ran it through the insurance company system that's built and designed by a, by a proper professional, access the insurance company's money to get rid of the debt. Now you've transposed who has the debt. It's not the third parties anymore. It's now with a party that you co-own. You co-own the lender. And now you get to pay that debt off from them. And every dollar you pay back to them is a dollar that's accessible for you to use again for some future purpose in your life. Whereas if you pay off the home mortgage, well, now all the money's trapped in there. You know, there used to be this commercial on TV. It was big in Canada a long time ago, Dave. There's these two little kids and they were walking around the house at night and they had flashlights. And the one little, they're in their pajamas and the one little boy says to the other one, says, what are we looking for? Equity. Dad said it's in the walls. Okay. And they're, so they're, you know, they're walking around. It's a banking commercial, but well, if you want to access the equity in your property, I don't care if it's, you know, a house a rental house, a multifamily property, commercial property. I don't care if you want to access the equity, you got to go and access someone else's pool of money to do that. Or you have to sell the property. Well, if you sell the property, now you give up the future potential of what that property can do for you. You're making an opportunity cost decision. So the only two ways to liberate equity is collateralization or you got you to sell the asset. That's it. There's no, there's no other option. So you're always dealing with someone else's pile of money. Well, if you're dealing with the insurance company's pile of money, but you co-own them and you get to share in all their profits and you have all the control of dictating the terms of when and how you reallocate money back to it based on your real estate deal or whatever deal you've got going on, you just have total and absolute control. See, Nelson Nash said that um, when you classify things properly, everything becomes very simple. And the problem is, specifically in the insurance industry, they've done a really poor job of classification. 
they never should have called it whole life insurance. What they should have called it was a personal monetary system with a death benefit on the side for good measure. But that would be a really long, silly, we need some kind of an acronym or you know, a better way to describe it. But that's ultimately what you have. And then if you understand how to use it, they, see, you can have, uh, if we had two cars that came off the assembly line, you and I, we each had the exact same car. Now we talked about Colby's before we hit the record button. We have different Colby scores. Okay. I, I can tell you for sure. I'm probably going to get a lot more speeding tickets than you. And, and I'm probably going to drive the car a little harder than you. I'm just going to take a wild stab, but that's most likely going to be the case. Now, if, if we had two exact cars off the assembly line, and then five years later, we had a mechanic go and look at those cars and they assessed, you know, what it looks like on the outside, what the engine looks like, the braking system, the rust, all that stuff. We're going to have two very, very different cars. But the day they came off the assembly line, they were the same. Would you agree? Yes. So the car didn't do anything different. The only thing that was different was what? The way we drove it. The way we drove it. It was 100% based on our behavior. So whether or not you get success in who controls the banking aspect of your life, which is happening now, someone is performing the function of banking in your life. Always. It can be you. But for most of society, it just isn't. So whoever is the is the operator and the behavior of that person will dictate the success that they have. And that's where good education, good podcasts, good training uh, and coaching go a really long way. Yeah. So how do you quantify that, Richard? Right. I, I think a lot of people are always looking, you know, we're, we're used to looking at yields right on different investment vehicles, whatever they be. So we're always kind of thinking about what's the ROI, what's the yield, right? Um, and since this is a little bit elusive, um, how are you able to really calculate that value, uh, you know, on a from a quantifiable standpoint? I think that's an amazing question. And I think with that, with that question really matters the most is with the individual getting clear on what they value. So if you don't have a measuring stick for what you personally value now, then it's hard to quantify everything. It's easy to quantify something on a spreadsheet, but spreadsheets can lie to you just as much as they can tell the truth because it depends on what numbers you feed it. And then it depends on your interpretation of the numbers. So the numbers themselves don't lie, but how you view the numbers can, could potentially lie to you. Does that make any sense? Yeah. If you and I were looking at the exact same spreadsheet, we never seen it before. Is my vantage point, my look at that spreadsheet and yours going to be a little bit different, even though the numbers are identical? Yeah. And we'd so, have to talk through it to determine what are we actually looking at? And then yeah. if we ran that through a filter of what we value, now you can quantify what it really means to you. Yeah. Okay. So I've got uh, two additional questions as a breakdown of that. But the first one being, you know, talk to me about uh, opportunity cost. Right. So, you know, you talked about putting money in here. Uh, we know that there's a certain portion of that that actually goes against your premium. Uh, what on average uh, should, you know, people be estimating from that standpoint? Uh, OK, so, yeah, opportunity costs and then, you know, kind of like how much to put into premium. I think it's kind of two separate questions there. So yeah. I'm going to talk about opportunity cost. Opportunity cost shows up to us in a lot of different ways, specifically if you're you know, a real estate investor, you're, you're an investor, you're looking at that. And a business owner looks at it differently, I think, than the rest of society. But just fundamentally looking at your at your capital, you're going to take, let's just say you're going to take uh, $5,000 and put it towards a family vacation. Well, as soon as that money goes, you, you use your visa and then you pay off the visa. Okay, so the $5,000 is gone and you get the memories of the family vacation. So the opportunity cost of not going on vacation is you don't get the memories. So that's one of the opportunity costs. Financially, though, that $5,000... Well, if you're 40 years old and you're going to live until 90, well, you've got 50 years of future earning potential on that $5,000, don't you? And let's, if we just use a very simple amount, you know, I don't have a future value calculator on me, but let's just say it was at 4% roughly just to keep it super simple. Well, you're probably looking at about a 25 to $30,000 decision. So that means that $5,000 vacation today is actually worth, let's say, five times that amount in your future. And it's a matter of whether or not you were able to contain the money. So if you have a containment facility for the money that is in constant motion and always growing for you, you can harness and capture that spending powers opportunity cost in a way that you could never do before. So that's one way that, that again, isolating IBC, you know, infinite banking concept versus, say, an investment are different because investments 
first of all, Nelson Nash's definition of investment was something you know a great deal about. Anything else is speculation. Most people call the investments that we do today, their investment products. That doesn't mean they're an investment for you. What it means is it's something you can invest in, but you're actually speculating on the end result. Whereas if you're well-trained and educated in a niche area and you're, you're highly knowledgeable about that, now you can make a fundamental good decision that is an actual investment. So that's the big kind of defining factor. So if you're going to access money for a $50,000 you know, private mortgage or $50,000 in piece of investment real estate, well, the money's got to come from somewhere. And if it comes from your cash, well, now you're making a decision that you can only do one job with that 50 grand. You can buy that investment property. But once it's in that property, now you can't really get it back out again to go do the next thing. It's tied to that asset. Whereas if you were able to get the money into, let's say, a well-designed policy first, and then you could access the exact same $50,000 from the insurance company's money, OPM, well, now you've got money working in two places, in the insurance contract, constant motion for the rest of time, and you got the exact same investment deal. So, so now you can do two things at once effectively, and you also have a massive amount of protection tax-free wrapped around the whole environment which you otherwise wouldn't have in the first example. So that it goes to control, it goes to opportunity costs, and it goes to the utilization of efficiency of your money. IBC is more about efficiency than it is about investing. Investing is something everyone should be looking at doing, but not unless they're knowledgeable about that which they are doing. <laughs> yeah, I think some people get mixed up too and think it's maybe one versus the other. Right. Mm -hmm. But the idea here, what you said, which is so powerful, is that you're actually say, taking the same dollar and using it twice. Right. And, and, and if you follow the ultra wealthy and what they do so well is, you know, it's all about creating multipliers right with your money and it's doing multiple things and you've already talked about probably a dozen different things that i you know i, I could i could talk about here like uh the creating legacy wealth uh creating tax-free growth creating a tax-free income stream and ret retirement uh having the power of liquidity uh you know just to name a few so you know when you encapsulate all of those and then think about the value of that and then to your point earlier how does that really align with you know what's most important to you um you know i think that's how you can place the value on it which is powerful now, i'd love to share something that you highlighted on about that legacy piece and can i tell you a quick story about something yeah. that actually happened last night so last night i had one of the most epic conversations with my wife we've had in a long time and it was just phenomenal we actually talked about maybe launching a podcast together which is kind of cool but she, you know, we're putting the kids down. So my kids are five and seven and they both had a karate belt test and got a new karate belt last day, which was great. And so, you know, my wife is putting my son down later. We were talking about it and somehow the question came up about, you know, why is our family awesome or whatever? And in, in my son started talking about, well, you know, there's a lot of reasons why we're awesome. And, you know, it's because of you and this, and Hey, we, you know, you're able to stay at home and dad works from home and we have, you know, we're able to go on vacations and do these things. And a lot of that's because of the family banking system. So we're late at night and my son's volunteering this information to my wife. So let me talk to you about the fundamentals of legacy and thinking differently and how we approach things. Now, I know you have triplets. I know you've got a, a number of kids and you're probably going to be getting into grandkid zone pretty quick. So I, we could have a whole fun conversation, I'm sure, about that. But, but when it comes to legacy, so I started teaching my kids, you know, as soon as my daughter was about two and a half, I have found an opportunity in a storybook I was reading her at bedtime to start talking and introducing the idea of the family banking system, the family piggy bank. And so now when we go on vacation, we have a family banking meeting. Now my kids are still five and seven. So it's not like we, we take like 25, 30 minutes to keep their attention. They get a treat. All right. This last family banking meeting, we talked about passive income. We talked about books and how the books that daddy's been writing, they're going to create a long-term passive income. And we talked about active income. And so when I'm standing in front of a computer screen in my, in my office and there's you know a camera on, that doesn't look very active. Whereas when my wife is building a cool art piece out of wood in the garage and that she sells and someone comes and brings physical money to the door, the kids can recognize activity level that produced a result. Does that make sense? So yes. the visual connection of that. So we talked about active versus passive income and we talked about the family banking system. So anytime that we go do something fun, we go out for dinner, we go and the kids get to do a cool experience. We go on family vacation. We, I always bring it back. I said, so kids, why is it we're able to do things like this again? And they said, they both go, because of the family piggy bank or the family bank. Oh, awesome. High five, high five, you know, big hugs. And it's like, what do we have to make sure we do? 
We have to put the money back in, dad. Oh, great. Why do we have to put it back in, kids? So we can use it again later. Now, do my kids know about what a bank is? Do they know what an insurance contract is? Do they know what an investment is? And do they care about any of that stuff? The answer is no. What they recognize is that we get to do fun things. It all comes from a reservoir, a warehouse, the money pool, our money pool. When we access from the money pool, okay, we drain some of the water out. We have to put the hose back in and refill the pool. It's that simple. And we're operating in an aquarium. And so nothing that we work with financially leaves the aquarium, but the aquarium keeps expanding in size. That's what infinite banking is all about. That's what family banking is all about and the legacy you can create. So the stories we tell, the words that we use, how we show up in our conversations around money in the household, in the family, whether your kids are gone and left or you got grandkids, the way that we show up there is going to be the defining factor to the success of the generations that follow you. And we all have an opportunity to show up differently there, I believe. And I think, in my opinion, Nelson's concept automatically bridges some of those gaps with people if they can start to change the way they communicate and think. Last piece of this story is right here. Imagine for a moment, you have 45 pieces of rental, pro 45 rental properties. I don't care if they're buildings, 45 doors and two buildings or 45 single family houses. I don't care. You've got 45 of them. They're all fully paid for. They're all producing an annual cash flow, and they have guaranteed market appreciation regardless of what goes on in the market or the next presidential election. You with me so far? Yep. Okay. Now you've aged up a little bit. It's your time for graduation. You're no longer with us. 17 of those properties that were all fully paid for automatically sell the moment, the, the moment you die for 100% of their highest value ever, their highest appraised value ever. There's no real estate fees. There's no closing costs. There's no estate taxes. There's no capital gains tax. 100% tax-free goes to the family and a check is cut. You don't have to worry about listing the properties. You with me so far? Yep. Now you have 28 properties that are still fully paid for in available, still producing a cash flow that the family inherits with no tax consequence. How do you like my real estate deal so far? You, Pretty solid. You, you want to know who created that? His name was Nelson Nash. He wrote this amazing book called Becoming Your Own Banker. Nelson had 45 whole life insurance policies that he owned. He actually had 49 at one time. He gave a couple away. And he, he was operating on his great grandchildren when he passed away at 88. So he had every member of the family, including himself and his wife, Mary. So when Nelson passed away, 17 tax-free death benefit checks were paid. 40, or, uh, 28 of those policies, which are property, it's the property in the way of contract versus in the way of physical real estate, but it's still property transferred 100% tax-free to his family members. And all of those are still producing and growing cash every single day. They're all seasoned and they will all produce a tax-free estate value on somebody's life. Some of those things probably are almost a hundred years out before they'll even materialize in that format, which means Nelson created four generations, four generations of nonstop capital accumulation for his family all because of the way he thought, not because of the product he used and not because of the investments he did, because he controlled the banking function and how he thought about things differently. Well, such a great example. Um, I want to ask you uh, another question, Richard, that uh, I think a lot of people struggle with on this topic if they want to actually proceed. Um, it can be challenging to figure out, you know, what do I figure out in terms of my premiums? right? What, what is that size of the bucket that I want to create? And there's lots of different ways to look at it. So love to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, this is so super good question. So, I mean, there's, there's number one, I mean, everyone said for the longest time, and you know, you go back to some of these well-written books and, you know, the richest man in Babylon, et cetera, is that you should be saving or, or setting aside 10% of your gross income. Okay. Well, so if, first of all, if you've been able to do that, you're ahead of the game than most people, because a lot of people just aren't doing that. Okay. So congratulations to you. So, but why would you stop at 10%? So you could start at 10%, but there's no reason you can't incrementally increase that. All right. So set a good goal, set a good target. If you don't have a good goal and a target, I can tell you, you're not going anywhere. You know, you plug in an address in the Google GPS there. 
it takes you where you want to go and it even reroutes you if there's an accident on the road well that's your life and that's your financial life if you don't have a goal and a target you, you ain't getting there all right you need to put some effort into that first but i would say at minimum a person should be planning on 10 percent of their gross household income and and that's a great starting point if you can't get there well then do what you can here's the key thing though what we find when we meet with people and you i'm sure you discover this all the time dave when you meet with people and you get to dump out their financial junk drawer and sort through the mess that they've created in their life, which everyone has a bit of a mess, you can see things that other people can't see, but it's always been there for them. You can see how they're spending money on this you know, junk mortgage insurance, how they're spending money on that, how they're spending a bunch of things monthly that could be annual and automatically could save them 10% in like seven areas of their life. And that's all freed up cash flow that can go back into a system. They're sending money to all of these miscellaneous savings buckets for an education fund, for a vacation fund, for the, the home repair fund, for the, you know, you got escrow for your rental properties where you're putting for future property tax and for insurance payments and for your repair and maintenance fund, your vacancy allowance. Well, all that stuff is building up in the account, but it's just sitting there wasted dollars that's not being very efficient for you. So if we take a look at all these buckets of inefficiencies and we were able to pool them strategically, or to strategize, as I like to say, then you can put yourself in a position where you can reallocate the existing dollars to create a maximum level impact in your family's life. And so even though you might only be able to do 10%, when you get together with a good coach, we might find another five or another 10%. And we can help put that to work for you because it's flexible. And if it's flexible, it gives you breathing room to allow you to make good decisions, you know, ad hoc. We all have these random things, tax refund, an inheritance, you sell a property, you do a rental flip, you do, um, you know, you have an investment payout. Like there's different things that happen. You get, you get money for your birthday. Like all these different little events happen. If you have a place, a dedicated warehouse to shove that when it happens strategically, that's optimized for your life, everything begins to change, but it all starts with one step. So I personally think 10% of gross income, household income is the, is a good starting block but people should actually be targeting something closer to 25% because you're going to be borrowing and using that money back into your life. So your ability to get more in is actually higher than most people can understand. But until you experience it, you won't know. Next piece of this is I asked Nelson Nash several times in conversations with him. I said, Nelson, how did you know when it was time to start a new policy? How did you know it was time to grow your system? And he would say, uh, <laughs> Richard, as soon as my feeble brain could envision doing so. <laughs> and that was it. And his answer was laser consistent every single time, time. Which, which means your behavior, what's in between your ears is the only limiting factor to what's possible to you. That's basically the summation of Nelson's 88 years of wisdom around yeah. that aspect. Yeah. Awesome. Love it, Richard. Um, let's transition a little bit for a second to um, uh, the personal development side. I know you're a huge uh, proponent of that yourself. So if you could give the audience just one piece of advice on what practice has yielded the most results for you, uh, what would that be? Well, I, I mean, we kind of talked about it a little bit um, before we hit the record button, and that's uh, that's the Colby A index. Um, I'm a big fan of Colby and when I say practice, what I mean by that is the Colby index teaches you about your innate instinctual way of getting things accomplished in the world. How do you actually do every day you do things? How do you go about the doing instinctually? You might inherently know some of them, but when you can be detached from that and you can read it to recognize key areas, it, it really fundamentally helps you think about how you can operate more effectively and efficiently in the world. And today I was having a conversation with my wife about Colby and I actually have a binder. I'm going to be printing off a lot of that stuff. And we're going to be starting to introduce our children to some of these types of concepts because they have colored bars. So it's visually appealing for the kids and it's going to create some fun discussions in the household, I really think. And, you know, my wife and, and I, my Colby are, are fairly different. She's a mediator, but we have also some key similarities. And so when we recognize certain like tension or whatever comes up, well, sometimes we can just pull out this binder and we can flip through. It's like, oh yeah, here we go. This is, this is, this is where I went wrong. I see I'm, I'm doing something in this area that really makes it difficult for you. So, so it's a really helpful tool. And what, what Colby really did for me is it helped me understand that I was perfectly all right. 
and that everything that I was doing was doing it the way it was supposed to be done, where the world was telling me I was out of place. I was doing things wrong. Like, why can't you just do this? Why can't you just do that? And I, I got all these like, okay, well, like, is there something wrong with me? Like, why is it that I can't do it the way that you're doing it? Well, it's because I'm not built to do it that way. That's why. And in fact, if I do it my way, I always get better results. And in fact, my results often outpace your results because I get more done at a faster pace simply because of the way that I'm built. And even though I might, you know, I might start a hundred projects and I might only get 25 of them done, but where I started a hundred and I got, I got 80 of them to 50% and I got, you know, 25 of them done to a hundred percent, someone else only started 10 projects. So the, so the, 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 there's nothing wrong with either method and there's nothing wrong with you, but what could be amazing with you is if you understand what's perfectly right with you and you could amplify that as a, as a game changing tool in your life. Colby's done that for me. Yeah. Love it, Richard. Um, I think unique ability is definitely one of the things that's up there. That's one of the top things that you could really learn about yourself. And it's been great to introduce that to our kids. If listeners um, are interested, we actually had uh, Julia Waller uh, on the show. We talked about unique ability and we got deep into the Colby test. So go back and check out that episode, uh, which is really awesome. And I know it's been amazing creating a team that also, you know, works, uh, you know, in harmony with unique ability, uh, as well as with our family too. And as our kids kind of grow up, um, having that understanding of a unique ability, I think I, I love the word harmony, right? It just mm. creates so much more harmony uh, in the household versus having friction to say, you know, um, you know, someone's just wired a certain way and they want to do it a certain way. And I've actually gone also on a couple's workshop uh, with my wife and we were able to, you know, work through uh, our each of our Colby scores. And, you know, we're just so much more, you know, congruent and understanding, you know, because of those things. And I only wish I knew that 25 years ago. <laughs> so so right. thanks for sharing that, Richard. Um, really awesome. And um Really appreciate you coming on the show today, uh, providing, you know, so much value for everyone, so much, um, you know, wisdom and insights uh, from Nelson and from your own journey. Um, I think it's really, really powerful. And if people would like to, you know, connect with you, learn more, uh, what is the best place? Well, uh, you know, what I'd love to do is offer everyone a copy, a uh, free digital download of our most recent book. Uh, we're, we're launching another one here shortly, but uh, our second book, Cash Fall as a Leader, is available. It's it's a nice, quick, easy read. It's got some great pictures and images in it. And they can go to cashfollows.com. That's cashfollows.com. And they can go ahead and grab that. A uh, ton of great resources in there. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm pretty easy to get a hold of as far as that's concerned. You know, you can also go to uh, our podcast, Wealth Without Bay Street. Um, we're on you, we're on the YouTubes at wealthwithoutbaystreet.com forward slash YouTube, nice and simple. And, uh, you know, one last thing I would really recommend people do, Dave, if you don't mind is, you know, Nelson, everything I do and all the good in my life, almost all of it has stemmed somehow from getting to know and meet Nelson Nash. So I really want to share what, what I think that ripple effect can do for other people. And there's a great documentary film that we commissioned on Nelson Nash. It's called, this is Nelson Nash, uh, the creator of the infinite banking concept. And you can go to nelsonnashfilm.com. It's one hour, one hour well spent. Uh, if you want to get connected to the idea of money and, and talking about money in the household with your spouse, it's a great thing to sit and watch together, you know, cast it onto the smart TV from YouTube and, and you go to that website and, and you're really going to learn a ton and get to understand the impact of what, this type of thinking can really do for your family over an extended period of time. Awesome. Thanks so much, Richard. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Dave.